Hello and welcome to another online Bible study for our Wednesday night crowd. Those of you, maybe it's Wednesday night for you, might be another time that you listen to this. <clears throat> Tonight we're going to be looking at the idea of a reservation of judgment. Might say a reservation for judgment. We'll show that to you in the final verse of our reading of our text tonight that's going to be found in 2 Peter chapter 3. So let's begin reading this second epistle, beloved. I now write unto you, and both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of the heavens excuse me by the word of god the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished but the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. My purpose tonight really is to look at this reservation of judgment, but to focus on contrasting worldviews. And it's what we have, and you can see it more and more today, uh, emphatically that there are contrasting worldviews that people have. The reference that we were looking at, of course, in Second Peter is a reference to the coming of Christ and the judgment of the world. And it is a biblical view that stands in stark contrast to the worldview. The worldview that most have in common with most men, educational systems, government, scientists, and even many religions. It talks about how that they are willingly ignorant of the judgment of God that happened in the past. It was sent by a universal flood. That's denied. Yet, all but one man and his family were saved. Noah preached that the judgment of the Lord was coming and no one believed him, and they perished. Peter told us and tells us that the characteristics of the latter days will be similar. Paul told Timothy that the last days would be perilous times. And if we listed the characteristics of these last days, we would find a number of things. Now, I'm only going to primarily look at two, but we're going to see them in these contrasting world views. Number one, we're going to see a noticeable apostasy. The world view that God's word is true, it's final, it's our only rule of faith and practice, and the noticeable apostasy, the other world view, they don't pay attention to God's word. In fact, they pick and choose what they want to believe, when they want to believe it, or when they want to use it. Secondly, contrasting worldview is that there is a noticeable immorality. Christians, by and large, know that we are supposed to walk and conduct ourselves according to the standards of God's word. Yet we see from the Bible that in the end times, and I believe that we're there, We've been there, but it's most noticeable now that you can see these two contrasting views. So let's look at these noticeable apostasy and immorality, these contrasting worldviews with what we find 
in the Bible. We're going to first off look at this notice of apostasy in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and 1, where the scriptures say, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. That's pretty serious. Instead of believing the truth of God's word about most anything, and in particular about the coming judgment, men will believe deceptive spirits and the lies of Satan. Instead of fearing the coming judgment of God and repenting from their sins or from their way of thinking, men are today taught to fear global climate change more than anything else. In fact, they are becoming more and more willing to sacrifice a great deal of their freedoms and their beliefs, a lot of other things, because they believe a worldview that denies that God has clearly revealed the truth about the future. Now, what we said about that verse at the very beginning in in Second uh, Peter, again, the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, the word that judged the world and caused a flood, universal flood, the same, the same word now keeps this heaven and earth in store and reserves them under fire against the day of judgment. Now, I want to also make mention of 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 9 through 13, where he says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Look, but the day of the Lord, excuse me, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, talk about global warming, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? It's very, very important to me to understand. In fact, let's keep reading verses 12 and 13. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein as the, the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. The long period of this reservation, meaning between the time God promised it and the time God brings it about, has the purpose with that long suffering of God to bring men to repentance. The planet that you and I live in is not dying, but is being preserved by God, but is being preserved for this future day of judgment. Planet temperature certainly is rising. And that doesn't mean that man should ignore his responsibility because we know it's not going to be destroyed by man. But we ought to be careful of our responsibility as stewards of God's creation. But this stewardship should reflect a fear and a reverence of God and his sovereign control over our environment. That should be the worldview that affects the way we live in light of the coming judgment of God. Our educational system has long denied creation and embraced evolution. Men have denied and do deny the flood and man's accountability to God and the destruction of man for his sin. Instead of trying to understand the flood and the ice age which followed afterwards by 
making wrong conclusions. Men have made faulty decisions which will affect our children and our grandchildren if the Lord delays his coming. But they will do nothing to prepare them spiritually to stand before a holy, a righteous, and a sovereign God and be judged by him. They're not preparing for that. A government, an educational system, a judicial system, a population, and even religions which deny the Bible and the faith of the Bible make up a noticeable apostasy that we can see clearly in our day and time. It's very hard to deny Paul's statement to Timothy that we are in the latter days. There is a noticeable apostasy. There is a noticeable abandonment of the truths of God's word. These forces, even the religious that we talk about, have a form of godliness, but the Bible says they deny the power thereof or the power of the inspired and preserved word of God. They deny the power of the Holy Spirit in the use of the word of God. Remember that I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for them. That's the power. What is it? It's We preach, but what's the real power? It is the Holy Spirit who quickens and makes alive and gives a hearing ear and a seeing eye and a heart that can believe. Remember, we're talking about a contrasting world view of what does the Bible teach? Do you believe the Bible or do you believe the scientists? Do you believe the Bible or do you believe your government? All my life, I was taught about evolution. All my life, I was taught about millions of years in fact, it's gotten larger and larger of when the world came into existence. And you can remember that chart of seeing man as nearly a slug and then evolving into the shapes until finally he's standing erect as the man he is. That's a lie. That's evolution. That is a contrasting worldview to the Bible. And today, you even have many religions that are adopting this. There is a noticeable apostasy, a departure from the word of God. Secondly, I mentioned that there is a noticeable immorality. In Jude chapter one, well, there's only one chapter, verses 17 and 18, says, but beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ how that they told you there would be, should be mockers in the last times who should walk after their own ungodly lust. These same words are repeated there in Timothy or uh, Peter that we looked at earlier. So both Jude along with Peter clearly tell us that in the last time or the latter times, there will be a proliferation of those who walk after their own ungodly lust. I'm not going to list the various sins and pigeonhole people and say, well, see, there it is. There's that sin. There was the problem. Listen, we know what the Bible declares as sin. The point is that their worldview will lead them to travel or to live in the sphere of ungodly lust. They are people who do not live in fear or reverence toward God. They order their conduct in agreement with the lust of their flesh. And I'm going to tell you, the Bible clearly tells us also, even though you do that, it is always insatiable. It will grow worse and worse as men give in to their unnatural or even natural ungodly affections. This, again, is an, a contrasting worldview with the Christian who believes the Bible to be God's inspired 
and preserved word. Titus tells us that we are a people who have been affected by the grace of God, which teaches us, if we've been saved, then the grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. Let's read it. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, then how should we live? We should live soberly, seriously, righteously, and godly in this present world, knowing that there is a reservation for judgment. Paul said that these latter days will be perilous for the Christian to live in. Perilous in a number of ways. They will be distressing and they will be difficult. Our standards of living will be mocked. And they are mocked today. They're mocked as being mean, antagonistic, unkind, and insensitive. Men mock the Bible and the godly living that it teaches. And they mock the accountability of all men that they will have before God. You see, even salvation is mocked when we talk about salvation from sin, because the modern world view is that the transgression of God's law is an outdated and old fashioned concept. The arrival of these days is certain, and it is clearly revealed in the Bible. And it appears that we are living in them today. I say that too because there will be a huge contrasting worldview between the regenerate and the unregenerate. The warnings are written for us and the noticeable apostasy and immorality is obvious. We have been warned in the Bible that false Christ and false prophets will rise and they will even show signs and wonders for the purpose of seducing or causing to lead astray even the elect, if it were possible. Isn't that great though, <laughs> that it's not possible? Yet these days, we learn, will be difficult for the Christian. But we're not left without hope. We are not left without warning signs and clear direction. The effect of the work of God in the believer will not allow us to fall permanently away into apostasy or immorality. But Christ did tell his disciples to take heed. Pay attention and do not follow after them, for many shall come in his name to deceive. And he says they shall deceive many. So he warns them. Remember, Paul told the churches of Galatia to stop becoming entangled with the yoke of bondage, with those men who were coming and teaching the law. He told them not to fall prey to the bewitching look of the false teachers. So some were falling prey. Some were becoming entangled. John told his readers to try the spirits in his first letter. Try the spirits, whether they be of God, because he says many false prophets have gone out into the world. Look at Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8, where Paul told that church to beware lest any man spoil you through vain deceit, through philosophy, excuse me, and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Don't let their pursuit of knowledge, this was against the Gnostics at this time, which they pursued a false knowledge, but don't let their pursuit of this false knowledge lead you away and make you their spoil. They're trying to capture you. They measure Christ by their knowledge, when in fact, all knowledge must be measured by Christ. There's a big difference. 
Christ is the sustainer of all things, and he has preserved and is preserving this world for a coming judgment. Yet we see a whole generation being taught a fearful, contrasting worldview from what the Bible teaches. This judgment will be against the ungodly, and it will include a fiery judgment and destruction of the heavens and this earth. Paul's final inspired word warned us of the scoffers, the corrupted, the camouflaged, the conceited, the covetous, and the hedonistic. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 17, he says, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware, lest you also being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. He warns us, Peter does, that we might not fall from the steadfastness that we have in Christ, knowing these things. Now, we cannot ultimately fall away, but we can be led away temporarily. We can fall prey to the wrong world view for a time. We can be led away with this error of the wicked. Now, during the time of Christ, many were led away by the error-filled preaching of the Pharisees. But the truth preached recovered many and saved many. The signs of the times were everywhere. If you remember, there was a sign of the time, which was the voice of one that came crying from the wilderness. The prophets Isaiah and Malachi told them, talking about Israel, of the harbinger that would come. But many, when he did come, when John did come, they did not heed the signs. They did not heed the voice of John the Baptist. They did not heed the signs of the miracles of Jesus. And any more, I should say, than they heeded the words and the preaching of Noah and his warning of impending judgment. The true prophet today has no new revelation. He has no new warning. In fact, the prophet today is just simply the preacher who has an ancient warning given long ago. There is a noticeable apostasy. There is a noticeable immorality. And if you have not yet received Christ as your Lord and Savior, you need to heed this warning. James teaches us that the end of lust is sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. We need to be impressed with the signs of the noticeable apostasy and the noticeable immorality and be aware that we not be led away with the error of the wicked. They do not believe in a holy, sovereign, all-knowing, all-powerful God. They don't even believe that God exists. They don't believe in a pure, inspired, and preserved Word of God. They don't believe in an impending and coming judgment. They don't believe that sin is a transgression of God's law. In fact, they don't believe it is a sin to live according to the desires of the flesh. They're now teaching that you follow your natural desires. That's normal and to be accepted and followed. This is a contrasting worldview. This is the error of the wicked. And what God thinks about it, he records it. He stated it in Romans chapter 1 and verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness 
and of righteousness of, of men who do what? Who hold the truth in unrighteousness. God has revealed his wrath before and he will reveal his wrath against it in the future. There is a reservation of judgment. It's found not only in our original text in 2 Peter, but throughout the word of God. Don't be led away with the error of the wicked. Instead, do as Peter states in the closing of that chapter. Instead of being led away with the error of the wicked, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To that I say amen, and Lord bless you. May God keep you from the error of the wicked.